Welcome and thank you for joining us for this webinar presentation. We are the Homeland Defense and Security Information Analysis Center, or HDIAC, one of three IAC domains in the DoD Information Analysis Centers operating under the Defense Technical Information Center, DTIC, within the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. Our informative webinar series highlights current and emerging research and technology developments. It presents an opportunity for accelerating the DoD's leverage of these advancements by increasing awareness and fostering technical collaboration. HDIX serves as one of the premier information research partners and curators of technology advancements and trends for the Homeland Defense and Security Community. As such, our organization supports those working in the Homeland Defense and Security domain of DoD research and engineering. We do so by helping navigate the vast landscape of scientific and technical information, allowing our customers to get a head start on their technical projects. With an understanding of the Homeland Defense and Security DoD research and engineering landscape, we provide research and analysis services. We help unlock access to information, knowledge, and best practices from government, industry, and academia to stimulate innovation, foster collaboration, and eliminate redundancy. We hope you enjoy this webinar presentation and that it serves as a catalyst for community collaboration and improved DoD Homeland Defense and Security Research. All right, good day, everyone. Uh, my name is John Clements. I'm the technical lead for the Homeland Defense Security Information Analysis Center, or HDIAC. Uh, and we are proud to present and happy to present uh, the no uh, webinar, Novel Nuclear Forensics, with uh, Dr. Robert Hayes from North Carolina State. But before we get started, uh, I'd just like to point out a few administrative items. Uh, and um, that is, there is a Q&A. Uh, we'll do a Q&A at the end. And the, the, the best method to submit the Q&A is at the bottom right of your screen, it should be, there's a three dot menu. And if you click on that, you'll see Q&A in there. You can submit your question there. Uh, and at the end, I'll read off the questions to Dr. Hayes uh, to, uh, to get his answers on your questions. So feel free to drop them in there. I will also monitor the chat and I'll try to catch any questions that go in there, but uh, it's just the best of it gives in that Q&A. Uh, all attendees are muted, um, so if you, but you do have access to the chat, and so certainly feel free to use the chat, talk to each other, and uh, like I said, I'll be monitoring that. So if a question pops up, uh, and or if you're not seeing the slides or something, then um, you know please please let us know. Uh, but with that, uh, I think that about covers the admin notes. So uh, I would like to go ahead and introduce today's webinar presenter. Who's uh, Dr. Robert Hayes from North Carolina State University? He's an associate professor of nuclear engineering at NC State, where he oversees the university's health physics graduate certificate and minor. He currently hold, holds a joint faculty appointment with the Savannah River National Laboratory and is an associate editor of the journal Radiation Physics and Chemistry. He is also a licensed professional engineer in nuclear engineering, a certified health physicist through the American Board of Health Physics, and a fellow of the American Physical. Physical Society and Health Physics Society. He served for many years on the federal radiological emergency response teams in various capacities, along with over a decade at the waste isolation pilot plant, enabling geological disposal of tra transuranic waste. His research focuses on novel shielding technology, radiological air monitoring, along with retrospective dissymmetry for nuclear safety, nonproliferation, emergency response, and radiation protection applications. He now serves on the Advisory Council for Nuclear Security for the Administer Administrator of the DOE and NSA. And with that, Dr. Hayes, I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Can you see my slides okay? Uh, yes, I can. All right, let's do it. So first, we need to talk about theory. So to start off with, we're going to actually start with Schrodinger's equation. But all we really need to notice from Schrodinger's equation is that it's a second order differential equation. What that means is that there are two solutions. One solution, because of the, the nature of the equation, is going to be imaginary. That's basically if you're looking at the a hydrogen molecule, that's the anti-bonding configuration. The lower energy state is the actual bonding configuration. So there are two solutions. One is bonding and one is anti-bonding. That's probably enough 
to get you where we need to go for the next step, because now we're going to talk about how the anti bonding solution becomes the conduction band and the bonding solution becomes the valence band once we put these into a lattice. So, what we do with the Schrodinger's equation is that we basically say we now in a lattice, we now have periodicity. That becomes the boundary, uh, the boundary conditions for the Schrodinger's equation is periodicity. And when we have periodicity, all of those energy levels, basically they have to be, be the same. Now, there are going to be some small, small perturbations because the electrons, if we go back to the Schrodinger's equation, you see that the, the, the wave function is proportional to energy. The, the second derivative, sorry, the second derivative of the wave function is proportional to energy. That's it. And that means that when I have low energy, that means then that I have low curvature. The second derivative, the second spatial derivative is fairly small, which means that the, the first derivative is going to be the slope. The second derivative is going to be the change in rate of the slope. So the change in rate of the slope is going to be small when the energy is small, basically when I'm at the valence band. What that means then is that those electron wave functions are fairly flat. And so they overlap a lot of adjacent uh, sites. And because of that, the Pauli exclusion principle says you can't have the same quantum number, so they have to sm slightly perturb themselves, and they become uh, different energies that, that actually is effectively a band, a uniform distribution. What that means then is whenever I have a deviation from periodicity, any kind of a defect, an interstitial, a vacancy, uh, an impurity, then that gives rise to the potential to have an, a stable energy state or quasi-stable energy state between the valence and the conduction band. And what that means is if it's below the Fermi energy, then that becomes a place that I can actually remove an electron easily. And it becomes like a P-type uh, defect. And we call that the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. If I have a, a, a quasi-stable state above the Fermi energy, then we call that uh, 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 the highest, oh, I said that wrong, the highest occupied molecular orbital are those that are below the Fermi energy and the lowest unoccupied are the ones above the Fermi energy. But these are quasi-states where I can trap an electron or trap a hole. The key is, is that those then become sites that when I expose something to ionizing radiation, I can either remove an electron from one or I can trap one of the ionized electrons at one of those defect sites. Here's the basic theory. If you just look at the energy picture, if I expose something to ionizing radiation, I take an electron from the valence band, I put it up to the conduction band. It then has a certain probability of diffusing into one of these lowest unoccupied molecular state or orbitals and I trap an electron there. Likewise, the hole can migrate and come up into one of these highest occupied molecular orbitals and then I trap a hole there. And then the idea that we're gonna, we're gonna be looking for is that I then am going to, after I expose something to ionizing radiation and I start trapping electrons and trapping holes, I put a little bit of energy in to say one of these trapped electrons and it goes up the conduction band and when it recombines with a hole, that energy difference is given off as a photon that I can capture with a photomultiplier tube. So I can do this extra energy input with either heat or a laser, filter out the laser light, and then I look for this output signal. This is what we do with thermoluminescence and optically stimulated luminescence. Here's the basic theory that we have, is that when I, when I have radiation come in, I take an equilibrium state, I put it in a metastable state, I stimulate that metastable state with heat, as in thermoluminescence or laser, as in optically stimulated luminescence, and I get out a, a special photon that I look at. So I have to have a, a photomultiplier tube that's got the right photocathode that has the right wavelength sensitivity to see that signal, and then I return it back. <clears throat> I return the material, or at least those holes, back to their equilibrium initial states. When we do this, the signal that we're looking for when I'm doing this recombination is generally a decaying exponential for each site. So I have, uh, if I have multiple sites, I'll have multiple decaying exponentials. And the signal from OSL is that I have this decaying exponential. And what then happens then for small doses is that as the dose increases, the number of trapped charges will increase. And so the OSL signal generally is going to increase linearly with dose because the probability of trapping an electron is going to be proportional to dose until they start to become full and then it will be saturated and this, then this curve becomes a saturating exponential. But for low doses, say for worker dosimetry and things like that, this is generally going to be a linear response. With thermoluminescence, I've got to get the, the KT of energy. If you remember that from your thermodynamics, once the KT of energy from thermal energy becomes equal to the energy difference from that electron 
to go back up to the uh, uh, a trapped electron to go up into the, the, the conduction band and then recombine. Once I've got about that KT of energy, I'll start to have that process take place. So a thermal luminescence peak is actually a peak as, as, you, as the KT of say here 200 degrees centigrade starts to become equal to the energy difference enough to get that electron to pump up to, to, bump up to the conduction band. I can then have the recombination and then uh, for each trap, I'll have a TL peak. And again, it's going to be linearly proportional to dose for small doses. So here's what the instrumentation schematic looks like. I have a sample on a disc and I'll heat it or I'll give a laser light to it. And then when the recombination takes place, I'll have a filter that will filter out the laser light or something like that. And I detect it with a photomultiplier tube. And that's basically how we do worker dosimetry in industry, either with OSL or with TL. This is what the peaks look like as a function of uh, the ramp rate. So I can ramp the, the thermal luminescence up at different rates and I'll change the spectrum because of the, the, the thermal uh, transfer. And this is what spectra look like from different types of TLD. So TLD 500 or TLD 100, they have different types of traps. And so I get different types of TL spectra. This is the actual instrumentation that I have in my lab where I do this research. This instrument down here on the bottom right is a combined thermal luminescence and optically stimulated luminescence spectrometer. And I'm gonna show you a lot of research that we've done with that. We also have a medical physics OSL system. This is a Landauer nanodot system. We've done some research with that too. It's a, it's a medical physics a secondary standard uh, dosimetry system. And these are what those dosimeters look like. They're quite small. You can see that they're actually, the dosimeter material is alumina. It's carbon doped alumina. And these are very small. And this right here is actually a, a, uh, an operational worker dosimetry badge. That's my badge, in fact. Uh, and so we do a lot of research with both of these. I already went over that, I'll skip that. This is what the actual process looks like. So if I bring in a sample, uh, and it's got some initial dose or some initial signal, I'll make, I, I can take multiple aliquots and I can give them multiple doses. And what should happen is that the, the signal should increase linearly with dose as seen down here uh, or up here. The idea being that whatever that initial signal is, I need to back extrapolate to the x-intercept to figure out what that dose equivalence is. In other words, I need to know the sensitivity. And I can do that with TL and OSL. One of the things that's much more uh, potentially useful, particularly for silicates, natural silicates, is this single aliquot regeneration technique. And what we do there is we'll, we'll look at the initial signal that comes in, but then when we, when we, after we've looked at that signal, we'll re-irradiate the sample uh, with uh, increasing doses, but then after that, we'll irradiate it with a test dose. So what we're looking at is the signal per test dose. So it's a relative signal. It's the amount of light output that you get as a function of readout, but I always normalize it. I divide it by a test dose. So it's actually a relative fraction that comes up. And these always are going to be these saturating exponentials. So what you see here is the pink is the initial signal intensity. And you interpolate that on this regenerated curve. That's what the regeneration is. It's when I look at the signal as a function of additive dose, but I always divide it by an, a, a, a test dose afterwards. And so that's this technique that can be very powerful for silicates as opposed to simple additive dose where I just take multiple aliquots and I give them multiple doses, uh, do a linear fit and then back extrapolate to the intercept to figure out what the initial dose was that corresponded to that initial signal uh, amplitude when I brought the sample into the laboratory. So additive dose is the most intuitive, but single aliquot regeneration or the SAR technique tends to be very powerful when you're dealing with silicates. Here's an example of some of the stuff that we did. So I took a sample, uh, I took a brick, and I went and I put an am uh, a cobalt source on one and then a cesium source on the other. After irradiating this brick with these sources, took it in the lab and did a core. From those cores, I went and then I did slices and I made and I took the core and made it into slices. And this is an, e uh, an MCMP representation of that. So you can see the source up here and then you can see the slices of the core underneath it. And I did one right underneath the source and then across from the hole in the brick. This is the brick right over here. And then, so I did a, a core under the hole, under the under the source, and then a core across the hole. So this is a complicated geometry. So this was a way to do retrospective dosimetry with a brick in a complicated geometry. Once I took those cores, or those slices, I then crushed them up in a mortar and pestle, and I sieved them into different grain sizes, and then I put them into uh, a device like I showed you there, a TL OSL spectrometer. And what you see down here are the reconstructed doses. Oh, I also did the uh, heavy liquid separation to remove the silicates from the brick. I then did dosimetry with the silicates. And you can see here both the measured dose profiles 
uh, compared to the MCMP. And so this is in the core right underneath the source. But then when you did the core across from the hole, you can see this is complicated, right? Because the exposure is going through a hole, but it's got to go through the brick, through a hole, and then to another set of brick. And so you get some complicated geometry. And then it did, and then we looked at both cesium and cobalt. And what you can see over here is the one-to-one -one correspondence line between what was calculated with MCMP versus what was actually measured. And you can see what this is saying is that I was able to reconstruct not only the dose, but the source and where it was at in, with, with MCMP. So this is the first hint at the kind of nuclear forensics capability that you have in terms of matching up energy and uh, source position just based on doing retrospective dosimetry using ubiquitous building materials like brick. Here's another example, except for this time we used americium. And with the americium, I put this americium source on the brick and then I had a couple of these nano dots there just for verification and validation purposes. And then we did that whole process again, basically taking a core underneath the brick and then slicing it. This is the MCMP picture of that, the schematic of the MCMP, where you can see the slices that were crushed and then were used for OSL and TL. Right here on the right, you see the mass energy absorption coefficient. So the mass energy absorption coefficient is energy dependent. And so by coming over here and looking at the actual measured dose depth profile versus the MCMP, you can see we get really good agreement. Up here in this inset are the residuals, the residuals after being perturbed by energy. So in other words, we say, all right, so I know what the energy was for americium. What would happen if the energy was a little bit lower or a little bit higher? And you can see the sum squared of the residuals quadratically increases. Now, if you assume that that little, that little uh, 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 minimum there is normal, if you can assume that, if it's normal, then that means that if I were to invert this, that might look like the top of a Gaussian. And I fit this, I fit those residuals to the top of the Gaussian to come up with an estimate on the uncertainty. So at the one standard deviation level, we publish this here in this paper up here, the one standard deviation level using americium, using the fact that it's got this, we, we, we actually empirically measured the mass energy absorption coefficient. We measured it by that dose depth profile. We, we showed in this paper that at the one standard deviation level, the energy resolution was 10%. So a 10% energy resolution at the one standard deviation level for a brick. So we turned a brick into a gamma ray spectrometer with a 10% energy resolution capability for americium. So now you're starting to see what kind of ubiquitous gamma ray spectrometry capability comes from doing retrospective dosimetry with ubiquitous materials. Using that same theory, say with brick, and now I'm going to look at uranium hexafluoride. So I published here in the Journal of Nuclear Mag uh, Materials Management how using the same concept for brick with uranium hexafluoride based on the energy deposition profile that you get from either high, en high enriched uranium or low enriched uranium, you could discriminate the two. So if you had a place like Natanz using the dose depth profile from the different types, but this is looking at both the, uh, the alpha N, the spontaneous fission, the bremsstrahlung, and the gamma, and looking at what those would be, you can decide, you can term, de determine empirically if somebody ever had high enriched uranium at their facility, even if there are no longer any trace uh, quantities of that uranium hexafluoride. The spectral measurement was made when the material existed. So now you can start to look into the past for forensics application to say, has anybody ever had high enriched uranium at this facility? Here we used the, again, this is that, uh, that Landauer nano dot. So this is a, a commercial OSL spec, uh, dosimetry system. And you can see the experiment. So we went out to the former Nevada test site and at their device assembly facility. And we had this, you can see here in the top right, it's four and a half kilograms of weapons grade plutonium. We laid out these dosimeters in a linear array. And based on inverse square, we could figure out what the actual dose was uh, uh, to these in terms of their profile. So down here in the lower left, you see the dose as a function of axial position. And what this tells you is that just looking at that dose profile, I could tell you uh, at the Z coordinate, at what Z coordinate along that array that, that, that weapons grade plutonium was. So I'm starting to image it. And what this then told me is that by the width of this profile, just the width of that profile, I could tell how far away it was. So I am doing gamma ray imaging using inverse square. And we published here in radiation measurements, this is a distribution using a, a, uh, a Monte Carlo technique where we estimated the, the, the diameter of the ball. And you can see that right there, 
uh, we're getting pretty close. Within a few centimeters, not only were we able to tell you where the ball was radially and axially, but we could even estimate the diameter of that ball. Uh, and so we're doing retrospective imaging of nuclear materials, and this is where we published it in radiation measurements. We also looked at, so then the, the question is, what kind of sensitivity does it have? So we looked at surface mount res, uh, resistors, surface mount electronics. Surface mount electronics is basically what you have in all electronics components today. And so here's a, a, a cartoon, a schematic of what these look like, where you have a, 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 a underneath these components is an insulator material. The insulator material is effectively just alumina with a, a polymer. Alumina, that's the same material that we make optically stimulated luminescence dosimeters out of. So this ceramic substrate, it's really just alumina with a polymer binder holding it in place. And so you flip those upside down and we turn those into dosimeters. And when we did that, what we were able to show, this is the dose, uh, the, the, this is a log log plot. This is the additive dose uh, approach that you would take to reconstruct these. And we published this in radiation measurements where we showed that we could date these components within 10 years just based on natural background radiation alone. So based on natural background accumulation, we were able to show that we could date these things to within 10, 10 years. That's the kind of sensitivity. We also showed based on the, appro the, the attenuation. So if one of these components was on one side of an iPhone and the other component was on the other side of the iPhone, using the attenuation through the iPhone, we could tell you if it was low energy like americium exposure versus high energy, again, based on the mass energy absorption coefficient of the iPhone itself. Again, a potential, uh, potentially useful nuclear forensics technique. Well, that begs the question, what about other applications? For example, let's say I've got a facility where there should be, it should be locked. For example, the IEA has a lock on it and there should never have been lights on there. Uh, theoretically, I could determine if any of these samples had been bleached with optical light, just based on say a smear of that range right there. And this, we, we, we published this in the Asarta Bulletin. We, we presented this there. So I could take a smear and I would normally count it in these kinds of equipment that I see here in the, uh, this, I have a, a, a Fosbridge detector, gross alpha beta. I have a, 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 oh my goodness, I forgot, a PIPS detector down here with this Bladeworks detector, a passive implanted planar silicon. That, they're all you're doing is looking at alpha beta. Um, and I could do the same thing with air filters, but if I put the particulate that I have, I actually have a, 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 a box on my TLOSL spectrometer that allows me to do single grain dosimetry. So theoretically, I could do single grain dosimetry using smears and air filters uh, for forensics application. The, the, the point is, is that right now the IAEA, when they get those smears and air filters, they do X-ray spectrometry to look for uranium or plutonium uh, elements. But if I were able to use that, what I showed here in the Asarta Bulletin is that I could get in forensic information from those if the dose was high enough and I had a sufficiently sen uh, sensitive number of uh, uh, mineral particulate in the smears or the air filters. This was a fun one. Uh, this was actually in one of my students' uh, doctoral dissertations. I, uh, I taught the student how to do this stuff, uh, and this student uh, was then given a blank problem. I said, I'm going to give you a wall. So we, we made this wall. You can see this wall here empirically, and this is the MCMP model of it. So I'm going to give you a wall, and I want you to take that wall and tell me where the source was and what the source was. He actually panicked. He was able to tell me where the source was, but when he did measurements on what the energy was, these are the energy, this is the perturbation, uh, same analysis as you did before, and then you invert it and you fit it with a Gaussian to come up with your uncertainty. You can see that the energy that he reconstructed was, it was uh, above 2 MeV. Uh, oh, I got the units here wrong. This is MeV. These both are MeV. The bottoms, they're both the, the, the same data, the top and bottom. The point is, is that he said it was above 2 MeV, and he couldn't figure out what that was. He assumed it was a point source. And he said it's clearly not uh, cobalt. It's clearly not europium. He actually uh, uh, became very distraught over this. But I knew that it was actually Godiva. It was a pulsed fission spectrum. And when you look at the actual energy dis distribution for the fission spectrum, it's got this huge high energy tail. And he nailed it within uncertainty. It was clearly within the 95% confidence level. And we announced it, it was a blind test where he was given this wall as a blind test and he was able to reconstruct the energy and position of Godiva to within uncertainty at the 95% confidence level. And it was, uh, it was brilliant, uh, even though uh, uh, he was very distraught. And I just told him, look, just trust the measurements, just report the measurements, that's your job. You're an experimentalist, an experimentalist, report the measurement. And, and it worked great, it was brilliant. 
We then went the next summer again to the former Nevada test site, and this time we did 3D imaging. So this time we took those same nanodots and we did it in an array. So the first one where I had a linear array, I could only tell you uh, the, 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 the axial position, the z-coordinate, and then the radial position. I could not tell you the azimuthal position. I needed a, a 2D array to give you 3D imaging, and we went back and did 3D imaging, and we published this again in the Asarda journal, and you can see the heat maps of those. And he was able to reconstruct those again uh, within uncertainty. So the next thing we did is we said, all right, so everything we've done so far is destructive measurements. You're destroying something. And so I collaborated with a partner uh, where we did uh, uh, retrospective dosimetry using the scrapings from a PC board. So we went off and bought a bunch of cheap watches. We went and irradiated the watches, and then we reconstructed the doses to these watches using the scrapings. So the, the PC board was left uh, uh, intact. So I could, I could re, basically put the watch back together and it should still walk, work. But all that we did were just these scrapings. And we showed that for emergency response applications, you can get within a gray uh, uh, easily. And here's one of these dose responses that we did using this technique. And we published that in radiation measurement. So that's just the scrapings from PC board, which has very trace amounts of fiberglass in there using, again, these retrospective dosimetry techniques. Here's a research project where a student did where just using a silica spray on the outside of a canister could also provide you with some uh, uh, forensic information uh, just because it's aluminum. And uh, he published this in Radiation Physics and Chemistry. And another student, this was actually a master's thesis. This student showed that just one dosimeter, just one is enough for actionable intelligence if it's in the right place. Uh, he Pearl published this in the Asarda Journal, uh, the Asarda Bulletin, and basically it simply is if I'm diverting spent fuel, uh, all I need is just one measurement and I can discriminate between whether that, that, uh, that, um, that bundle had been placed, taken to the wrong place or not. And again, this was published in the Asarda Journal, uh, the Asarda Bulletin, sorry, demonstrating that even one is enough for actionable intelligence if, it, if, if you're looking for, the, uh, for that thing. All right. That was TL and OSL. Now let's talk about electron paramagnetic resonance. This is going to be what you use if you don't have a transparent mineral. Uh, TL and OSL, basically you need the, uh, the, the particulate to be transparent so that if I have a grain and I'm heating the material or, or whatever uh, re recombination is happening at the bottom of the grain, the light has to transport through the grain to make it up to the photomultiplier tube. If you don't have that, you have extremely low sensitivity, but paramagnetic resonance can see through everything. As long as it's not a conductor, you don't need any of that. It's like nuclear magnetic resonance, except for with EPR, we're looking at unpaired electrons instead of unpaired protons, which is what you get with MRI or NMR. And here's the theory, is uh, the energy difference between parallel and anti-parallel when you're looking at that magnet. I put the sample inside the magnet. All of those unpaired electrons, they're either become parallel or inter parallel just based on quantum mechanics. And then based on the energy of the magnetic field, the energy difference between parallel and anti-parallel is a fixed energy. And so I can zoom my, elect my magnetic field up through there and then expose it to a microwave beam. That's what this stuff is up on top. It's a klystron and I have a waveguide, so I have a coherent microwave field. And I can cause the electrons to absorb that photon. So I have a lock-in amplifier up here that will sensitively measure that and look at that absorption. This is what the spectral looks like when I do that from EPR. I have inside my cavity, so this cavity that you see here is down inside this magnet back in here. So in the, in the center of that magnet, those are Helmholtz, co Helmholtz coils. In the center of that are, is a cavity that looks like this. And inside that cavity, I'll have a little manganese standard. A manganese standard gives rise to these lines over here. There's hyperfine splitting. I won't explain that, but there's hyperfine splitting, but it's a G-factor standard. The G-factor is basically a constant that's a, a function of the microwave field, uh, the, the magnetic field, uh, and Bohr's magnetic constant, uh, constant uh, and that energy. So all of those uh, always give me something that's reproducible. So it's a, it's a standard that I can have in the spectrum, like having, say, potassium in a gamma ray spectrum. It's a, it's a constant energy. You can always see it uh, from background. And so with that, I can take samples. I can actually use this to, use this to, to normalize my G factor to, to remove the signals from my empty cavity. You can see all this mess back here on the sides. This right here is the native signal of an unirradiated tooth sample. And you can see this is very useful for epidemiology, where if I have, say, uh, deciduous teeth or something like that, I can reconstruct that signal. Off here on the right is where we published the actual native signal standard and then the dosimetric signal standard in measurement science and technology. 
when you're doing this, the tooth enamel, because it's a crystal, it's very anisotropic. So if you're using a single grain, you, your dosimetric signal will be very anisotropic, and you can see the amplitudes here. And this is all published, the idea being that by using a goniometer or some kind of uh, uh, averaging, I can get much more reproducible samples. So you can see here a native signal standard with a dosimetric signal standard that would easily be masked so that these techniques allow you to, to uh, to remove a dosimetric signal that's as small as this or smaller, even though the native signal might be huge, but it requires that I have to manipulate the spectra using these G-factor standards. Here's an example of how this works. When I'm, when I'm doing a, an empty tube, then a sample in an empty tube, and then I normalize what that empty tube needs to be looked like, and then I can get a nice, clean native signal here, as you can see there. And I can put the, the standards back in, or the, the, the Mangany standards back in, and then from that, I can subtract from a sample what the actual native signal is and then reconstruct that very small dosimetric signal. And that's why this is all there. And this was published back. This is stuff I did for my dissertation. What this paper shows is that these spectral manipulations can be automated. We published this in radiation protection and dosimetry. These can all be automated, all these spectral manipulations because they're based on standards, G-factor standards. Here's where we published a lot of stuff using epidemiology, where you're using <clears throat> where you're looking at the dosimetric and native signals. You can not only use it for forensics, but you can use it for epidemiology. Here's where I published that the uh, as, as, I as I change the sample size, the amount of uh, signal intensity, remember there are cosines, the, these magnetic fields, or the, 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 the photon, the microwave field, it's a cosine distribution. And so you, you do get a little bit of uh, focusing from the dielectric focusing from the electric component, but it's not completely linear with mass. So even though this, this, this is showing that the sample mass looks like it's linear, you can actually see that there are deviations because it's not a uniform field. Even though they're Helmholtz coils, there is still some curvature. And then over here at the side, you can see where we're looking at the microwave field, the microwave power dependency and how those signals all uh, evaluate. This paper, uh, uh, this paper is where we published what, how you were able to discriminate again energy. It's the same kind of concept. If I'm, if I want to figure out what the energy was from uh, dental X-rays, I know that there was attenuation through the tooth, and I can calculate that uh, and be able to come up with a way to construct that. So the energy deposition it gets high once you're in the tooth, and then it gets back low when you're in the tissue, either in the cheek or in the tongue. As a, and, and even as a, when you change the energy of the x-rays, you can still get very good information uh, to reconstruct those doses. Uh, here's a more detailed uh, 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 view where I published this in radiation protection dosimetry. And then here's where we published what happens if there's disease. And this is going to come back with retrospective dosimetry. What ends up with uh, uh, for forensics is you're going to get all kinds of different impurities. And just like with teeth, you've got to think about these impurities. You can correct it when you spend the time to correct it. Uh, this has also been used for dating and archaeology. Uh, if you're, if you want it, the, 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 this comes back again to forensics. Now with archaeology, you can see that there are signals uh, that are transient, and if they're transient, you can see if it was recently irradiated or not. And there's a lot of stuff that we're coming out with. I got a student that's doing his dissertation on this, and he's got in there some unpublished results that shows that you can figure out how long ago it was irradiated just by looking at multiple transient signals that are present, as you can see here. And this was again published. Uh, back in, I think this was uh, radiation measurements. Yeah, it was radiation measurements. Okay. You can also do this with organic material. So it's not, just, so this is showing alanine. Alanine is actually a secondary standard dosimetry technique based on NIST and showing that you, and what we showed is that using these same techniques, you can decrease the detection limit by uh, almost an order of magnitude using the fact that you've got these manganese standards in there and you're doing these empty tube subtractions. And we published this in Nuclear Instruments and Methods, or I did. Okay, doing the same thing with tooth enamel, you can drastically improve the sensitivity uh, for these signals. Uh, oh, sorry, this was with alanine, showing that yes, you can drastically improve the, the sensitivity using uh, alanine and radiation protection dosimetry. All right, now let's focus on what everybody came for. Radiological emergency response was part of it anyway. Uh, these are again all toys that I have in my laboratory. This is where my students went and did a tour of the aerial measurement systems uh, with the remote sensing laboratory when they came to town. So here is where uh, we, we published the use of this technology for sugar. So if you have uh, some kind of a, 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 a confectionery, you can use that as a dosimeter. And that's something that's easy to give up. You don't have to dismantle a watch. You don't have to give up a button. You just give off a piece of candy and you can reconstruct the doses uh, to, to energy levels that are well below those for needed for emergency response. 
Here's where we looked at diatomaceous earth. And for this one, this was a published in radiation protection dosimetry. Here we showed that you could do TL, OSL, and EPR on the same material. So this top left is the EPR signal of the diatomaceous earth. This right signal, uh, this right spectrum is the TL spectrum of it. And this bottom left is the OSL spectrum. And now this was really crazy because the TL spectrum looked just like glass. The OSL spectrum looked just like quartz. And the EPR signal looked like something we'd never seen before, never been published. And the thing is, is that diatomaceous earth is basically, these are like plankton that have a silica exoskeleton. So they don't have a carbonated exo, uh, exoskeleton. They don't have a keratinous exoskeleton like insects. They actually use something to sand, but it's not sand. It's amorphous silicate. So it's basically a glass. So the TL spectrum made sense because it's kind of a glass. It's a biogenic glass. The OSL signal didn't make sense because this is the spectra you get for quartz, but then you have a lot of quantum boundaries on these things. And the EPR spectrum was just so crazy. We just reported it and then uh, talked about how the what, what are the ramifications of having these kinds of physics taking place with diatomaceous earth. And this stuff is uh, it's a it's a common ore that you can find wherever you had ancient seabeds that have dried up and have left behind the, the plankton skeletons of these diatoms. Here's where we showed that using all these techniques, I can use a whole deciduous tooth. And do, using all these techniques, you can reconstruct the dosimetric signal uh, uh, to levels of interest, again, for emergency response. So a deciduous tooth, that's, again, something somebody might give up. And this was published in Health Physics. This is, again, uh, one of my uh, PhD students. And she showed that basically any sweetener, so it doesn't just have to be sugar. And what she showed, this was published in Health Physics, any sweetener, you can use these techniques to reconstruct the dose. And on top of that, you can tell uh, 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 if there had been any kind of annealing, what kind of thermal history it had based on the multiple signals. And you can see that different sweeteners have multiple signals, and each of those has a thermal annealing property. And so with that, you can figure out if you, if you reconstruct their sensitivities, you can start to reconstruct uh, irradiation times. And this was published in Health Physics. All right, now for the, the, the exciting stuff, EPR and nuclear forensics. And I still have a couple minutes, so we're on, we're we're good, doing good on time. This is great. So I mentioned before smears, and this one, the Asardiger bulletin, is where we basically said. So if I use all of these things that I've just shown you, as a general rule, there isn't anywhere that I can go and pick up something that's going to give me actionable intelligence. Now it can be a commercial dosimeter. Oh, that's easy and great. But there are other things because of all the things that I've just shown you. You're pretty much going to be able to find something somewhere, anywhere, always. Because you're always going to have brick, but you're not going to be allowed to take a sample of brick, but you are going to be allowed to take a smear or an air sample. Walrus Trust, I'll just throw this out there because I did this as part of my dissertation. They were out there swimming around. So if I want to see what kind of dose rates are coming off of a, 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 sunk, a scuttled uh, Russian sub, I might be able to find a walrus that had been up there swimming around one and reconstruct the doses. Here's the dose response from sheetrock from or wallboard uh, published in health physics. And then here's an interesting one. What if I wanted to intentionally put this material somewhere of interest so that I wanted to put a sticker on something? I can take this stuff. This is commercially available uh, sandpaper, but the sandpaper has aluminum. Well, that stuff, you would, you, would, you would basically stick that to a two by four piece and you have a sanding block. Well, I can put that wherever I want as a paint or a sticker. And now I can tell you if something has been so in other words if these are supposed to be there and they're not supposed to be anywhere else and that means the dose rate in this room is fixed and the light in that room is not supposed to be turned on until you have an IAA inspector if these things are supposed to be in a bunker and not on a deployment system and so I can tell if the dose rate's been the same in there or if I have a deployment system I can tell if the dose rate's been basically natural background just by putting stickers or paint where I would want it and these have all been published in the Asarda Bulletin, uh, Countering Weapons of Mass Destruction, uh, in multiple instances uh, where we put where we put forth that this is something that you can do today based on the technology that we're doing research in in my laboratory. And so in summary, it's all dosimeters, always has been, always will be. And uh, this is a meme that one of my students came up when they took one of my classes where we went through all the physics for all this. So I think I'm good. Look at that, 40 minutes. Man, I probably went too fast, uh, but uh, I guess now we have time for a lot of questions. I, I, I'm ready to, to, to answer them all. Let's go. All right. Well, <clears throat> because probably of the speed that you, uh, you went at, Dr. Hayes, no questions have trickled in just yet. I'm checking the chat and the Q&A, but I am, oh, here we go. Here we go. I imagine people are uh, 
kind of digest what they just heard. So uh, the first question that came in through the Q&A is, uh, is there a half-life associated with the radiated material? That's a great question. So there is with everything. Now, a lot of the signals that I showed you, a number of them are used for dating, which means that they have half-lives that are, say, millions of years. But uh, there are many, if not most, materials will have signals that have much shorter half-lives. So uh, one of the things that we found is that if you have the right kind of impurity in your mineral, then you can have ones that have a short and a medium and a long half-life. And why that's exciting is that I can almost tell you how long ago it was irradiated if I figure out what the sensitivities of each of those are, meaning I've got to do additive irradiations and then I've got to do subsequent sampling uh, and, and, and measurement with it. Well, not sampling, but measurement. Uh, I can start to tell you a time window about when the irradiation took place. So I'm not just telling you the dose that it got. Now, the dose is interesting in and of itself because that tells you it's the it's some me it's some measure of the product of the dose rate and the time amount, the amount of time of radiation. So if you know either the time or you know the activity and configuration, you can basically put the other one together because dose is some product of, uh, of, uh, of fluence or uh, flux activity and irradiation time. And so by being able to do that, you can get a lot more forensic information. The idea being with all that I've shown you is that if you ever want to have a radiation detector measuring anything anywhere, my laboratory has put it there. So this Harry Potter magic of being able to do ubiquitous detection, even in nuclear facilities, the United States doesn't know exists. Uh, based on the research in my laboratory, we're doing measurements now. And uh, it just requires that we go and retrieve those detectors. The detectors are deployed. Uh, and so, yes, there are multiple signals. And the, 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 the drawback of that, since I have time, the, the trade-off is that, all right, so all of these detectors are freely deployed. They're ubiquitous. They're measuring anything that you could possibly want to know. The trade-off is that it's only one spectrum. It's only one measurement per detector. And that's actually the easy part. The harder part is that each material, because of its chemistry and because of its impurity structure, each material is going to generally require a custom sampling, sample prep, and measurement protocol. And so that's the trade-off is that uh, where I have a detector, that's already built in with the electronics. Uh, that's not built in to, uh, say, a piece, a, a piece of rock sitting outside of a nuclear facility. That piece of rock, it's got light attenuation from the sun, it's got a thermal history, and then that it's got the radiation attenuation through that, but it's superimposed on the surface, optical bleaching. And so if I wanted to reconstruct that, I've got to take that into consideration, and then I've got to take into consideration natural background. Where natural background, you assume it's got some constant dose over a long period of time, and then it comes into an equilibrium where it's the, the signal decays at the same rate that is being built in, and then you got to reconstruct what the anthropogenic dose is above that equilibrium state. And so there's a big trade-off by having ubiquitous detection, and that's that, you know, it's got to come into the lab, and I've got to do a couple weeks worth of study to figure out how to discriminate, say, native signals, sample prep signals, or uh, avoiding sample prep signals, so that when I do the measurement, I don't do a measurement that's going to destroy the information, but will reconstruct the information of, of interest. So that was a pretty long answer to that. Um, but uh, I, I went through this presentation fast enough. I don't think I said that in there. Perfect. Uh, so as expected, a couple more questions trickling in. Uh, next one, how much of this has been shared with the uh, National Technical Nuclear Forensic Center, formerly led by DHS, but now by, led by DOE? Uh, I don't know that any of it's been shared with them. So the funding for this has come from the National Nuclear Security Administration. Um, a large part of it was through their consortia. They have, have uh, they, they fund university consortia to do work. And then some of it was funded by uh, an NNSA grant to Savannah River National Laboratory. So I, I hold a joint faculty appointment with Savannah River National Laboratory. And a lot of this, uh, and still a lot more, that gets more exciting, the stuff that's unpublished, the stuff that we're getting ready to publish, uh, is even far more exciting, but uh, that was done again with an NNSA funding through uh, the Savannah River. But I don't think I've ever spoken with the uh, whatever that acronym alphabet soup was that you mentioned. Very good. Thank you. Um, just to answer uh, somebody asked for about the slides and presentation recording being available. Uh, normally, the slides are up before we uh, start the webinar. We had some technical difficulties. So I will be posting the slides on the webinar announcement page 
hopefully later today. But also, we record all, uh, any of our uh, publicly available webinars, and they go on our YouTube site, which will also be linked. Um, well, you can go to our YouTube channel, HDIAC, uh, but also that will be linked on our website as well, where you went to we register for this uh, webinar, uh, just so people know. So they will be available, and I apologize for the delay on that. But another question that came in uh, is that your last slide stated that this won't work well with wet materials. What sample materials are best for conduct conducting a sound analysis? Also, is there a minimum dose and or energy emission required for statistically reliable data? Okay, uh, I'm not going to remember both of those as I answer them because they're, they're they're not okay. short answers. Uh, okay. So the first one, wet materials. Wet materials are fine if they're mineral or crystalline. It's when the water gets into uh, 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 physical contact with the centers because the water being a conductor will allow the electrons to recombine through the water instead of going through the mineral lattice itself. So if I took a brick and I got it wet and irradiated it, the only thing that's really gonna change is the mass energy absorption coefficient because now I've got to factor in the water with the attenuation. But the crystals of the brick, the dose to the crystal is gonna be in the bulk. And on the surface, what you get for recombination, you're gonna largely get just with air, just by diffusion. You're only gonna get a negligible fraction of attenuation to the to the quartz if it's if there's water on the surface. Where the wet part becomes a big issue is when we're talking about organics, because organics they're uh, they're not transparent, so you have to use EPR. And if I have an organic, the water can easily get in, uh, be absorbed by organic molecules, and allow those electrons to recombine. Uh, so if I was looking at a piece of cloth, for example. The EPR signals uh, would be very different with uh, 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 the, the decay rate for a wet piece of cloth would be very different than a dry piece of cloth. Uh, and so, and, and then on top of that, you got a different mass energy absorption coefficient because now I got to factor the water in. Um, the other question, I forgot what that was already. The second one part, the yep. second part of that. No problem. It is, is there a minimum dose and or energy emission required for statistically reliable data? Oh, I love that question. So, uh, because these are radiation detectors, there is always a, a minimum uh, signal amplitude that you can detect with any detector. That's the, basically the radiation physics are exactly the same. The big difference here is that you only get one measurement. Now, if you want to do more than one measurement, you have to have more than one detector because it's an integrating detector. And so the minimum detectable dose is gonna be a function of a sensitivity. The sensitivity is gonna be a function of the impurity content. And the impurity content is fantastic when you're using natural materials. If you're using synthetic materials, it's not so good. But natural materials, it's a lot better unless, it's, uh, unless you've intentionally doped it, like we do with TLDs and OSLDs. We'll intentionally dope those, so we'll have lots of impurities, so they'll be quite sensitive. But the more pure the material, like uh, for example, um, uh, uh, quartz grains that you would get, say, running off of a mountain, you can go either way. Some of them can be incredibly insensitive because they're high, really, really pure quartz. But if I start to get inclusions or impurities in that quartz, say it's a feldspar or it's a zircon or something like that, then the sensitivity goes up really high. So in a distribution of quartz grains, I can get ones that are incredibly insensitive and I can get ones that are incredibly sensitive, but most of them are going to be somewhere in between. So the more grains that I get, the more likely that I'll get a highly sensitive one that's going to have a really small detection limit. Uh, but if I'm only having one or two, then you're just hoping that you're going to get one because it's going to depend on those. So the sensitivity is a function of impurity content, and then the uh, the half-life is a function of the type of impurities that you have. So you want to have a lot of impurities so that you have a lot of different forensic information that you can extract from it. Uh, oh, and then I think for the first question, a conductor doesn't work because uh, if you remember that, that, uh, that energy level diagram, in a conductor, the conduction band overlaps with the valence band. And so there are no impurity sites inside there. There are no stable sites as a general rule because uh, when I cause ionization, the conduction band can go straight to the valence band because they overlap or they're close enough together that thermal oscillations will allow electrons from the valence band to jump up to the conduction band. And so conductors don't work and the same issue when you have water if, if because it's a conductor. Uh, unless and that, but it, it, it still work if something's wet. If the water doesn't get into the crystalline component that you're using for dosimetry, then you just simply have to dry it out when you make your measurements. But if you're doing spectrometry with it, you got to factor in the water with your mass energy absorption coefficient. So great questions, great questions.
It's fascinating. Um, another another question. How or yeah, how has this technology been incorporated into traditional nuclear safeguard regimes such as used by the IAEA? Ah, so it hasn't. So here's the here's the philosophy that's that 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 uh, that I use when I when I uh, um, apply for proposals. The philosophy for this is that once I've made it sufficiently rigorous, once I've shown that there is no material that can exist without us being able to get actionable forensic information, that then needs to be socialized. So we're not quite there yet. We're still doing, we still have a lot to do with natural minerals, like uh, like we did sandstone. There's some really actionable intelligence. If you can go out inside of, outside of a facility and pick up a sandstone rock, there's actionable intelligence there. We still have to do that with a lot of other minerals. The idea though, is that <clears throat> once we've done this, once we've shown that you can't hide it, then, and everybody knows that, then the idea is that the scientists that are being used for proliferation will recognize. If you can't hide it, then the benefit is not in hiding it. The benefit is in, <coughs> excuse me, the benefit is in confessing your actions. That way you can get as much out of it as possible through diplomacy. So the philosophy behind this technology is to literally allow the diplomats to do their job before anybody asks the military to do anything because you now have a much more uh, 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 compelling argument to not try to hide. If you don't think you can hide it, or you know that you can't, right, through uh, any kind of uh, forensic measurements for the IEA or, or other kinds of actions where somebody can get that actionable intelligence, you're gonna try to get as much as you can with the least amount of effort, which the argument is that uh, this will be uh, a persuasive argument to not try to hide it. And that way, you know, they can try to figure out their security issues without uh, resorting to nuclear weapons development. Did that answer the question? I think it did. I think okay. so. Um, I just pause for a moment uh, because I don't see any other questions in, but I'll, I'll go ahead and say, uh, you know, HDI Act does host a technical inquiry service. If you do come up with other questions, obviously you can email us at contact at hdi.org. I put Dr. Hayes' email address in the chat uh, up early in the, um, the webinar presentation. So if you wanna reach out directly to him, uh, he's very active on LinkedIn as well. So you can always follow him there and you, you'll learn, um, you know, in a minute or less, you'll become a, a nuclear engineer within no time. Uh, and also wanna point out that um, uh, next month, on April 11th, uh, Dr. Hayes is also going to be providing another webinar uh, for HDI Act titled A Technical Review on Common Myths About Nuclear Energy. So uh, seeing no more, oh, hang on, I think one just came in. We did get one more question. So uh, this will probably be the last one because of the time. But um, this question is, if a myth, oh, excuse me. Yeah, if a material you're measuring for past irradiation has a complicated irradi irradiation history, for example, multiple radioactive materials at different points in the past with different exposure times, how complicated do your spectrums become? Are you able to tease out each instance of irradiation? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, I didn't really address that. So, it, again, the, the physics are identical to uh, any other radiation detector. And what how that interprets to... Uh, using this technology for re with retrospective dosimetry is, uh, let me give you some examples. If I had been moving a, a source through, now there was a, a, some papers where I published this, like for example, that one dosimeter uh, actionable approach. If I took a source and I ran it through, then the actual spatial distribution, uh, if I had a distribution of dosimeters, the spatial distribution would measure that as though it was a line source. So that the total activity would be averaged over that line uh, for that amount of time, and the, but the, it's the same kind of a concept. If I if I reversed it, and I said I kept the source constant, but I ran, um, I had a, a, a handheld, and I did a long integration walking by a source. So it's really the same physics. It's just that there's a small relative shift there, and and so uh, in doing that, uh, those are the kinds of uh, changes that you have in that. Uh, a, a typical handheld might uh, take a new spectrum, uh, say every second or a fraction of a second. But if I took a handheld and I said, I'm not gonna do, I'm gonna do like an HPGE and I'm gonna do a one hour count. 
that one hour count, usually you've got stationary configuration. But what would happen if I did a one hour count? Let's say I was trying to do uh, consequence assessment and I'm trying to characterize the amount of uh, deposition on the ground. And, I, and so I've got the, my HPGE looking at the ground. Now, if everything's static, that makes sense and you can interpret it. But what if the wind comes up and blows some of it away or brings some more in? Then that's the exact same problem that you have if I have multiple sources with what I'm doing is that I don't have a static configuration. So the same kind of physics or the same kind of analysis you would have to do for consequence assessment if I have a change in ground deposition is the same thing I would have to do if I change my sources because that's what you're doing is you're changing your sources. And so it's the same kind of physics that you would you would you would apply uh, with a regular detector. Just keep in mind that now what I'm doing is like the HPGE where I'm integrating over a long period of time. And so if I change sources, it's gonna the, the spectrum is gonna look like I have a, a source. Of those uh, relative con uh, uh, of that of that activity again, the dose is a is a is a product of the activity times the time with a geometry factor in there, uh, and so that's the same kind of complicated physics that you would you would do if I had that HPGE with changing conditions. And yes, this is subject to the same limitations. If I have changing sources, multiple sources, uh, then it's the same kind of difficulty. Hope that answers the question. I, I think so. So thank you very much. Uh, again, um, Dr. Hayes, thank you so much for this outstanding presentation. There's been a lot of compliments to you in the chat. And I just thank you so much for uh, all the time that you've offered up to uh, to bring to do this presentation and provide this to the community. And again, look forward to another webinar presentation from you next month. Uh, so thank you again. Thanks for joining. Have a good day, everybody.